good afternoon based on where you are. My name is Charlene Brown, and I'm a senior fellow and director of the Racial Equity, Economics, Finance, and Sustainability Program at Croton Institute, an independent nonprofit research organization working to harness the power of investment for social good and ecological resilience. I'd like to thank you for joining us for the discussion on the role of, cap of private capital in agroecology in the Global South. I am joined by my esteemed colleagues, Gertrude Charai Jabson of the Participatory Ecological Land Use Management in Zimbabwe, Daniel Moss of the Agroecology Fund, and Jen Estoni of Integrated Capital, Capital Investing and the Agroecological Enterprises in Africa Project. Over the next 30 to 40 minutes, our goal is to create a foundational understanding of what we mean by agroecology, to attempt to define responsible investment in this space, and to share our thoughts on how we connect smallholder farmers and enterprises to appropriate capital. We'll then open the floor for questions. Before we dive into our conversation, I'd like to give each of my colleagues a minute or two to do brief self-introductions. So let me start with Gertrude. Uh, warm greetings, everyone. My spirit recognizes your spirit. Um, I'm with the Participatory Ecological Land Use Management Zimbabwe, which is a network of civil society organizations that are working with smallholder farmers to promote agroecological practices. Pelham Zimbabwe is affiliated to the Pelham Association, which operates in 12 countries in East, Central and Southern Africa. I'm also an Earth Jurisprudence Practitioner and my passion also lies with working with women um, and communities that restore the health of our planet. Thank you. Jen? Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, my name is Jen Estoni. I'm uh, the principal with the Integrated Capital Investing. Um, my work is to coach, educate, and catalyze foundations and investors to bring all of their assets and resources towards um, solutions for a healthy people and planet. Um, what that looks like in practice is encouraging and questioning, particularly philanthropy, um, to look at how grants, leadership, and their investments can make a difference for the environment and for people around their mission. Currently, I'm working on a joint project between the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa and the Agroecology Fund, which is called um, Agroecological, Supporting Agroecological Enterprises in Africa. And we're looking at the gaps in capital that smallholder farmers on the continent are facing in trying to promote um, agroecological production in local territorial markets. Great. And Danielle. Good morning, good evening. Pleased to be here. Um, I work with the Agroecology Fund, uh, which is a pooled fund, a consortium of um, 33 foundations from the US, Europe, and Asia that have come together to support agroecology movements around the world. Um, a, a key priority strategic direction for us is moving massive money into agroecology. Um, that includes the, the grant support from the member foundations, but that, of course, will never be enough uh, support. And the need for investment in agroecology is, is massive. So we have two complementary strategies. Uh, one is to work with bilateral and multilateral development agencies to help move their um, agricultural development money uh, the programs into agroecology. And another is to work with the foundations um, themselves, uh, our member foundations that have endowments um, and encourage their program and mission related investments in agroecological enterprises. Uh, so for that, we've created something called uh, the Transformational Investing in Agro uh, in, in Food Systems, a TIFS initiative, um, where we can accompany foundations in sort of sorting through the difficult work of assessing how they can move uh, investments into agroecological enterprises. Thank you. 
Great. So I want to start by setting the stage. So I'm going to stay with you, Dan, for a second. So if you could share with the audience, what are the key characteristics of agroecological farming versus sustainable farming? We saw often use those two terms, and I think it would be helpful to clarify. Sure. Thanks. Um, well, some of the, the, the folks on the, on the, in the audience today would may be familiar with, uh, we, we like to use uh, the Steve Gleesman's five levels of um, agroecological uh, transition. Um, and the first levels are really on the farm levels. Um, the first three levels have to do with increasing the efficiency of conventional practices um, to reduce uh, external inputs. The second is about substituting alternative practices for uh, more sustainable practices. And the third is redesigning the agro, the agro ecosystem so that it functions on the basis of ecological practices. So these are things that, you know, kind of more on the production side that the farmer uh, is, is in control of. The fourth level has to do with a more direct connection between the producer and the consumer. And so looking at, at markets. And the fifth is really building a whole new kind of ecosystem um, of our global food system that has a real enabling environment for agroecology and is much more involved with, with principles based on equity, participation, and democracy. Um, that is sustainable for the farming families and sustainable for the earth. So there's, there's, there's multiple levels of transition back and forth, a lot of dynamism. Um, and you know, the, the, the kind of, it, it's a, it's, it, and it's not necessarily a linear path, but those are kind of the characteristics of what to, to which uh, we strive as we transition the food system. Great. Jen, you and I had a rather interesting conversation uh, yesterday, so I'm hoping that you might jump in and share your perspective. Sure. Thanks, Charlene. Um, so I really, um, uh, in working on this project um, with my colleagues um, from the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa, we've been looking at the Gleesman model and uh, also collaborating with our colleagues at BioVision around their agroecology criteria tool and trying to understand one of the key questions, which is what is an agroecological enterprise? Um, there's not very much literature on this. There's actually practically none. Um, and there's a lot of very loose use of the term sustainable agriculture and supporting smallholder farmers to be involved in a green economy. And one of the things that we have noticed, and, and this is in a collaboratory conversation, is that Gleesman's five levels really, they're, they're sort, of a, sort of a transition or linear model and approach to um, how um, it's articulated. And it's really set in a um, moving from an industrial agricultural perspective to a more um, agroecological um, model. And what, we're find, what we find and we know from um, farmers in the global south and particularly in Africa is that um, actually the farming systems are um, situated along all levels. Um, so you can have very well developed connections between consumers and producers. Um, and we wouldn't even call them alternative food networks. We actually call them the central food networks around territorial markets, maybe well developed. Um, and yet, um, and they may have very strong, there may be very strong indigenous um, food production systems mixed in with um, areas where there's very high um, um, inputs, um, external inputs, such as chemical fertilizers and um, seeds. Um, so it's a very heterogeneous picture, and this notion of a linear movement through this doesn't really mm. work. And ultimately, what I think the, the feeling is, there's some really helpful elements and criteria to um, Gleesman's model, and it really needs to be redefined in the local context. And we're challenged, and this is very much the case in finance, um, when you look at the finance picture, is that um, Western ideas um, are really being overlaid on a very rich local cultural context and indigenous knowledge that we really need to slow down, take the time and understand and really be rooted in a place-based perspective. 
Great. I'm going to invite Gertrude to jump in. Um, and I'm going to pose a question to you, but certainly please feel free to respond to anything that Dan and Jen have, have pointed out. So Gertrude, from your perspective, um, working um, in the continent, in, um, in your native home country, why is it important um, in the emerging market context for us to focus on agroecology? And do you see small scale farmers understanding that concept? One of the things that I often worry about is that from a Western perspective, we bring in frameworks and ideas um, that uh, we bring in framework and ideas that we understand, but may not necessarily translate. Um, the vocabulary may be different. And so I, I just love for you to sort of talk about what agroecology looks like on the ground and whether or not that is a term that's recognizable um, to practitioners in the field. And for folks on the line, uh, Gertrude's uh, network is- uh, Okay, so thank you so much, uh, Shalene. Um, Go ahead. So hope, hopefully I'll be able to communicate, uh, people will be able to hear me. If not, um, perhaps we can hand it over to the other speaker. Um, so on the continent, there is um, a beginning to embrace agroecology, the term agroecology in the farming system. So we see this in Southern Africa, East Africa, West Africa. Farmers are beginning to connect how they were farming traditionally with what is being proposed under the agroecology models. But what we are also seeing on the ground is that many of the farmers are either implementing one or two principles of agroecology, not in its entirety, and calling it agroecology. So the understanding of um, agroecology versus sustainable farming, still there's still much work that needs to be to happen for that greater understanding of what it means to say your own farm is agroecologically sustainable. Um, I also see that from the work that we are doing, working with farmers, um, the practice of agroecology is being embraced at the practical level where Farmers are actually implementing, as I've said, the practices in the field, but also recognizing the other dimensions of uh, agroecology, which are these, the signs of agroecology and the agroecology as a movement. So, so I would say the understanding amongst smallholder farmers and civil society organizations working with smallholder farmers is increasingly improving. And um, there are challenges, particularly with the issues with transition. There are also challenges, particularly with issues to reach markets. There are also challenges, particularly with issues to do with financing because of the multiple challenges that farmers face by just farming using subsistence um, ways of farming. So, so when we are looking at, at the farmer at the grassroots level, we need to put into context that the majority of them are farming on less than five hectares, and there are small smallholder farmers by many environments. They are working using very inferior technologies use holes for plowing. They don't use um, machines, heavy machines for production. They depend on farm saved seeds. Um, if they do not use farm saved seeds, they many of them have been trapped in this industrial farming model where they have to depend on hybrid seed, fertilizers and chemicals. So transitioning to agroecology requires a lot of investment because the soils have been depleted. The farmers do not have enough income in their pockets to make the transition. And I know is um, various studies in agroecology say that there is need to give the time frame for, for farmers to be able to start to make profit before we can say they have completely transitioned. Many investors do not give that 
provision for the time frame for, for farmers to transition from industrial culture to agroecology. So I would say there is need to recognize the multiple dimensions faced by smallholder farmers, particularly with regards to access to loans, access to equipment, and just means of production so that they are able to produce enough to enter even into the uh, market where they are able to make more profit. That was very helpful. And I certainly, you know, from the work that I've done in, in previous parts of my life, um, all of the comments that you have just made are not unique to the continent of Africa, but definitely to the broader emerging market um, spaces. So if you look in Latin America, you will actually hear the same conversation happening. Um, so I, I want to sort of point that out. So this is, I think, a broad concept. And I think those of us who have been working to support smallholder farmers for long periods of time and to do a transition that is more beneficial both to the farmers and to the earth, um, have been sort of um, thinking about this and trying to work through um, what it really means um, and the difficulties of really working with small older farmers. I think what we tend to see in the marketplace, particularly where investors um, are, are, um, are present, is that there is always a tendency to move to medium and large, which continues to leave small holder farmers unserved. So, let me pose a question that um, I invite all of you to answer. Um, does the private capital or impact community really understand how best to support agroecology farming and enterprises? Um, and do investors really have a clear understanding of what is appropriately um, termed capital to meet the needs of the community? I think Gertrude just touched on some pieces, the need for um, inputs. Um, so how do we move from manual to perhaps more technologically driven uh, mechanisms? Uh, we need uh, appropriate loan financing. Um, what does that look like, particularly from um, the space of foreign capital, um, which often tends to be trying to move into this market? I'm going to open the floor. I can I can jump in and, and maybe just to um, <clears throat> I think that both Jen and, and, and Gertrude spoke to this very important issue uh, of kind of nomenclature and how we describe the kind of um, food system we're aspiring to. And we've been using the term agroecology here. And I, I just want to say that, you know, in the agroecology fund, we, we, we try to be, you know, generous with that term in the sense of, you know, this isn't about some sort of sectarian division between agroecology and regenerative agriculture and organic and uh, you know there are there are elements we're we're looking for experimentation that moves towards ecological processes and we know there are very a lot of complementary terms and practices out there that you know we encourage um, so we for example in the agroecology fund support uh, initiatives that they don't even use the term agroecology and, and that's fine we've been really buoyed by the fact that there's so much movement internationally towards agroecology and we see a lot of deliberations at the level of the united nations food and agriculture organization that provide a sort of you know broad global umbrella for this transition and we think that that's very important but i just want to say that that you know we, you know i i think we, we all have you know in our contact with both farmers and investors and development agencies that the terms are distinct um, and complementary and we are looking for those complementarities among them um, without uh, you know, excluding them. So I think that the only, the only issue there is being careful. We can talk more about this issue about greenwashing um, in the sense that we're hoping that these are really robust terms and really call um, investors, call farmers, call everybody towards these improved ecological processes. Um, and so the, the important thing is to adhere to principles um, as we move into the transition. Yes. Um, so, Charlene, I will just say that um, the dominant narrative still in financing smallholder um, uh, farmers is still one of increasing income and increasing production, irrespective of how that is done. And that is clearly not an agroecological perspective. And there is a very much a focus on um, individual farmers, although there is quite a movement to look at cooperatives and associations of farmers. Um, however, the, the very important levels of democratic participation and governance 
um, you know, the, the Gleesman level five is, is absent, I think, in that. Um, there's some um, discussion of that. So I would I would say that's the that's the dominant narrative. And if you look at about 80 to 90 percent of private finance that's going into the continent right now, and we've been scouring um, investment literature today, um, most of that is for loans that are over two hundred thousand um, dollars, which is not relevant to uh, most to to the majority, I would assert of smallholder farmers on the continent that are providing and accessing territorial markets. Um, they're really looking at loans of under $50,000. Um, so we have a huge gap. And um, what I will say is that I've had quite a few interviews, I mean, not, a, not, not hundreds, but I've had in the dozens of interviews with um, social finance, um, folks that we think would really be the ones providing this capital for agroecology. And I will say that currently, um, most of them do not have agroecological principles as part of their criteria. Um, and they do not have access to blended finance or to what I would call integrated capital to make this happen. So what we have, what I feel like we have right now is a really a bifurcation between those who are in the NGO, civil society and government realms who are promoting agroecological production, very much divorced from or separated from um, the finance opportunities that do not see any of these uh, criteria or qualities as critical to success in finance. And so there's a whole set of shifts that need to take place in order to redefine um, what is um, a sustainable finance. Um, I mean, I have some ideas on that. Um, and I will say that the social finance folks that I've been talking to who finance social entrepreneurs are really open to this conversation. And they're very excited about the opportunities for agroecology because it is um, focusing on climate resilience, which is something they're hearing a lot about, as well as nutrition and local food economies. And certainly with COVID, there's been a refocus on how do we strengthen um, local markets and local food um, um, uh, circulation um, that's within country and regionally instead of these very export and um, import dependent models that are not as resilient in these times of crisis. Really helpful. Um, I know that um, Gertrude has gone to audio, so I just wanted to, to see if she wanted to chime in. Thank you so much. Um, for our understanding and based on the reality of smallholder farmers on the ground, is that the kind of um, investment that's coming, the private investment that's coming to support smallholder farmers in to a larger extent does not really understand the, the context of um, smallholder farmers. Um, these uh, investments come with conditions which many of the farmers are not able to meet. And um, with these conditions, they, they confine farmers from doing what they do best, which is experimenting on their fields, finding things that work as they are, they are producing food. Um, the investment that's also coming um, secludes farmers because they lack collateral and only targets farmers that are already well up. So in many cases, this kind of investment is actually excluding the majority of farmers who have the potential to implement agroecology and who are willing to do so, but only lack the capital to, to, to implement. Um, in, a, in a way, I would say they, 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 there is that creation of um, power dynamics that's very un, unbalanced that confines farmers to only grow um, or participate in the farming system only to have the access to the funds, but not for the farmers to drive the production and enter a market on their willing basis and also choices in terms of growing the kinds of food that, that, that they want to produce. So already, even when the farmer enters the market, when, where other big players are, are already operating, they are entering the, the, the market um, disempowered because 
they they find it difficult to negotiate the prices they do not have the expertise and experience of operating at that level but also they are not able to experiment with the funds that they they would have received so i would say when really look at the 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 availability of private uh, capital coming to farmers it comes with conditions that disempower of smallholder farmers the ones that would have access but in most cases it excludes it's very exclusive um it, it excludes many of the farmers on the continent to to actually have this access to these funds over to you shall i can just jump in just a bit um yeah i mean in some ways i think it's about um being mindful of what's, uh, you know, what are appropriate investments? What can we really expect from private capital? And to be fair about what are the other kinds of complementary investments? You know, uh, both Gertrude and Jen, you know, talked about these other kinds of investments, especially as we start looking to the more transformational aspects of, of an agroecological food system and the, you know, what, what Gleesman describes as level five and this kind of enabling environment. I mean, let's just take a couple of things, for example. Um, you know, for example, the, all, all the perverse subsidies and all the perverse incentives for industrial agriculture that are pretty much pervasive everywhere, the kind of ways that the agrochemical industry has captured policymaking and moved public monies into supporting extension systems, research, et cetera, that bias the whole system towards industrial agriculture. That's not, that, that kind of dismantling of that system and shifting it towards agroecological food systems is not something that private capital is well positioned for it's not really appropriate at the agroecology fund you know our kind of our theory of change is based on the power of, of agroecological movements you know, really farmer led to lead that transition to do the kind of advocacy the kind of accountability with um, decision makers authorities that can move policies uh, to, in an agroecological direction those those movements need investment those movements need investment that are not a return on investment in the in the you know kind of investor sense so some Somebody's got to offer that kind of financing, you know, blended financing, grant financing to um, these agroecological movements to do their work of peer-to-peer -peer training, to do their work of organizing organizations, cooperatives, et cetera, that can build the power to, to make the transition. You know, similarly, there are other issues that private capital is not well positioned for. Um, domestic markets, you know, things like a municipal government might have a hygienic uh, plaza public market with good storage facilities. Um, that's something that needs to come from um, from public investment. Um, rural roads, which is obviously a critical issue. This is something that really needs to happen as a result of municipal government, national government, and maybe the participation of multilateral development agencies. That's a whole, you know, a, 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 it, it's an advocacy process that will derive from, you know, farmers felt needs being expressed to their authorities and building the political power to do so. So the, we, we, we think that, that those kind of investments are, are critical. And that's why we, as the Agroecology Fund, you know, we invest in these, um, in in the agroecology movements themselves. But then we think, you know, at, at that point, there's a lot of opportunity. You know, when you can kind of diminish the risk for these private investors by investing in that enabling environment, um, then there's a lot of work that the private investors. And in our case, we're focused on the in in, in the, the 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 principles, the endowments of the foundations, which are a little less maybe risk averse than some of the private investors, we're hoping that they can um, see the ways that they can invest some of that those funding in um, in the kind of appropriate scale smallholder farmer um, agroecological enterprises. Thank you. So you definitely moved us in the direction of where I want to take the conversation next. Um, we talked about a bit about trying to vision what was the appropriate role for responsible investing to support um, agroecology. And so the question that I, that I have sort of, I'm hoping that there are investors um, who have joined this conference. What does that look like? I think I've heard the phrase integrated capital, which I think we are all familiar with. And certainly from what Gertrude has pointed out, there is definitely a need for grant capital that helps with transitioning. And so where do we create those necessary collaborations? And then the one thing that I would add is that there's a universe of impact investors who say that they care about this, right? That they're trying to achieve a double or a triple bottom line. 
So what is the role of those investors um, in, the, in the mix of this conversation? Um, I'll jump in here um, and maybe come back around. So I do think that um, private capital, um, there are opportunities. It's a long game and you have to be able to look at the new economy that's emerging. And, um, you know, we're seeing this more um, um, in the global north where um, the, the strong move into environmental ESG, environmental, social and governance screened funds is really taking over the market now and um, with a poor performance of oil and gas. And so one of the, you know, one of the uh, movements is investment in renewable energy, um, solar and wind and, uh, you know, micro hydro are now have become profitable sectors um, for private investment. And you couldn't say that 20 years ago. Um, and I think there's a very similar um, opportunity um, in the global south around um, solar um, solar powered infrastructure in agriculture. Um, and we're seeing some interesting pilot um, opportunities right now with solar refrigeration to support um, uh, short supply chains or local production um, on the continent and ensure um, the to decrease uh, uh, food wastage and loss, which we know is a huge um, problem and burden on uh, local farmers around processing. So there are these, um, I guess, niche opportunities, and I do think they're going to multiply. Um, one of the other really interesting things we've learned through the research is there are a number of um, incubators and innovators that are um, piloting um, new sources of biofertilizers, biopesticides, um, and um, new seeds. And one of one of the enterprises is actually using um, wastage from um, fruit and vegetable markets. So their organic waste from the the rotting produce, etc., is being converted into organic fertilizer that's being supplemented with other natural minerals and is now being sold as very specific um, fertilizers for um, fruiting trees such as avocados, mangoes, et cetera, that is increasing farmers' um, production. And then they're able to actually produce more and sell more to the markets. So there are these, um, what we would call um, very um, cyclical and positive um, uh, uh, cycles of investment that I think private investment can take advantage of. There's a lot of enabling conditions that need to happen before that, um, but I do think there are opportunities there. Um, I, I do, you know, I have a few um, additions to what Gertrude was talking about earlier. I think we do need to address foreign exchange risk. Um, that's a big issue with foreign capital wanting to extract and not handle that. So that's a that's a role for um, something that needs to really be addressed. Um, the cost of small loan transaction size, um, I, I don't think that should be um, should be seen as impossible. Um, we have incredible um, resources mm -hmm. um, on the continent. Um, and I think that we can do a high touch model around um, loan. I don't think it's all about reducing transaction models. Um, crop insurance, again, is a really big issue and area for development. Um, infrastructure, as Daniel spoke about. Um, and then we're also dealing with subsidized competition from industrial production and marketing. Um, and I think a lot more support and use, innovative use of um, some of the cellular and mobile technologies can help smallholder farmers because they it's very ubiquitous now throughout the continent. Uh, those are all excellent points. And at least for me, I think that focus on the financial exchange risk, um, which is many times it's actually placed on the borrower as opposed to the investor. Um, I think those are certainly pieces that need to be addressed and that we need to have a long-term focus. I think we all recognize that within the broader capital markets, a, a focus on short-term returns is harmful for the things that we'd like to see and how we'd like to see the world move forward with a real value for both social good and, and e ecological um, resilience. So that piece, um, you know, if I look to what was historically called microfinance or financial inclusion, 
I think there was a clear recognition over time that the investors participating in that space needed to be there for the long term. And I think when we have failed, um, particularly around finance, um, failed to realize that long-term focus, um, what that has often meant is that we actually bring issues into those markets. And so we need to be very, very careful as we, um, as support networks of investors that are trying to support agroecology. I think if the investments cannot be long-term and they cannot do the kind of um, ecosystem building that we know is inherent to success um, and we can't find ways to mitigate the foreign exchange risk, then perhaps I would argue we shouldn't be there. And that might seem extreme, but I think the harm is much more damaging than um, simply being absent in, in the short term. Yeah. Um, Gertrude, go ahead, Jen. I just want to add one thing. Um, mm -hmm. I totally agree with what you're saying, Charlene. And one of the uh, points that has been point that one of the key issues is stickiness of relationship. Is the investor or the loan fund or the social investor, are they in it for the long term? And are is there stickiness of relationship? In other words, are they willing to go through the hard times with the farmer and the good times? And so there may be, you know, um, a locust invasion, there may be drought, there may be um, very severe price swings. How do we make, how, how do the investors um, go through these periods? Because there will also be um, positive periods on the other side. Gertrude, just wanted to invite you back in, in in case you had something to add. Uh, yes, uh, picking from what Jane is um, is saying, um, I think it's it's important to also think about investment that takes into cognizance the culture and traditions um, of the farmers, so that they are not, you know, investment does not come to change the way of life of a people, but comes to build or enhance. Um, uh, communities. So um, absolutely, I agree with what Jane is saying to say when investment comes, it, the funder, um, the investor should be able to stay with the community through through the good times and the bad times and to also do this within the context and understanding of the local knowledge and wisdom through which farming is embedded. Yeah, I, th I think we see that a lot in investments in indigenous food systems, in particular, where you know the the, the point is to, to to revitalize indigenous food systems based on the huge diversity of, of crops and traditions, um, and the importance of reconnecting people with traditional foods. And that the private investors are often focused on you know very few commodity crops, primarily for export markets, but all, occasionally for domestic markets, um, where the whole point is to kind of narrow the the the, the 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 conduit of, of products to a to a market that's you know guaranteed a specific uh, contract around coffee or mangoes or something but not really embracing that tradition uh, the, the the broad tradition of diversity diversity of knowledge and diversity of nutritious uh, crops I just wanted to jump in a little bit on on an issue that I think is is important as we think about this I mean we're, we're really excited about the work um, that we're doing with with Jen and Gertrude with the Alliance for food sovereignty in Africa partially because you know what Jen mentioned about the stickiness of relationships I mean we we really need uh, you know, but because it's such a difficult field, we 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 need a system in which the the produ the 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 entrepreneurs, the the agro ecological enterprises, are are woven together. They're in relationship. They're learning together. They're facing problems together. They're facing problems in their individual enterprises. But then they're also you know dealing together with these kind of large enabling environment questions that we were talking about about you know infrastructure about subsidies etc so the idea that that afsa the alliance for food sovereignty in africa is interested in this and, and also interested in sort of building out their identity as a network too where there is some support for entrepreneurs we, we think that that's that's really important and i i mean to be i think it's fair to say that in the agroecology movement there's ambivalence or there's it, it it's hard to capture those kind of social movement aspects of it that are working on 
you know, transformation of policies towards that enabling environment, calling out all the, you know, the perverse incentives, for example, working on land rights issues, and that whole development of, of uh, uh, agri-entrepreneur spirit and capacity. Um, you know, we, we know how badly those, those entrepreneurs have been screwed over years. Um, nationally and also by international financiers. So I think that this is kind of a, it's a little bit of a minefield. And I think that, the, but the, but the, to, the, in terms of investment and solution, it's, it's, it's investing in the movements that can, that, that can navigate that. And I don't think that, the, you know, this is part, this is a challenge for private capital is, you know, we, we need to in, invest in this kind of infrastructure like OFSA itself, uh, you know, that can really develop a strong voice and capacity amongst the, the the millions really of entrepreneurs that uh, Officer represents, um, so that they can I, I mean, so so that they can continue that that work together, which is you know at, at the end of the day it's really beneficial to the private investor because the, 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 these these entrepreneurs are only going to be successful when they have a, a a voice a voice that includes training but also includes advocacy. So I think that in some ways it's to me what's really positive about this is just. The chance where, where you know the kind of work that, that Jen and Gertrude are doing, you know, awakens the investors to this need for this kind of social infrastructure. Let's say that's really embodied in this you know continental um, network, this continental movement. Great. Um, so I'm going to add one thing to this wish list as we're sort of visioning. Um, for me, I think as we think particularly around the financial exchange risk. So certainly, as I said there can be a role for capital if it's truly impact capital. Um, and I do think that the integrated capital structure is one that we need to be looking to as we try to do this work um, in the continent and around the world. But the piece that seems to be sort of the big hurdle um, in my life talking to investors is that foreign exchange risk. So if, to me, there is a place for the foundation community in particular to come together to create some type of foreign exchange facility that enables them to actually do this work and removes the risk from the people in the field, the farmers who are borrowing, and have the investors who are much more sophisticated in, in managing that um, deal with that risk. So that would be my wish list item. Um, there are a number of questions coming in from the audience, and so just being mindful of time, I, I do want to get to some of those. Um, I'm just going to read them to you, and um, please feel free to uh, to jump in. Um, so. Here's the first one. It says regenerative ag uh, may be complementary, but it, but it, but if it lacks the social political dimensions that make its success um, and scaling out possible, that makes its success. I'm sorry, its success and scaling out possible. Should we be pushing agroecology as the most effective and less co-optable greenwashing way forward? Do you want to go through all of them, or should we take the questions one by one? Um, so they're all like multiple pieces, so <laughs> happy to do that, and maybe you guys can jump in in a few. Um, so the next one says, how do you think a potential gap in, under, in the understanding of the intention of private capital influences both investors and smallholder farmers who do develop relationships? Namely, A, are smallholder farmers at, at risk of being taken advantage of based on unfavorable investment terms? Or B, do investors put themselves in a position where they will see no return or at least not be able to exit for an extended period of time? Um, to me, I think this question around exit is perhaps related to um, equity. Uh, and at least in my experience, most of what comes into um, to support smallholder farmers tend to be debt as opposed to equity. So. I'll leave those two on the table and certainly open it up to, to you guys to respond. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to jump in. Um, I think I want to just um, take a, a step back um, around um, return. Um, and I did attend a really great session uh, last week um, in this conference. And one of the key points they made is that farmers themselves are making the lion's share of investment 
in innovation and um, engagement on their farms in the production of agroecology. So we're really starting out with a lot of capital investment at the beginning. And um, when I saw one of the questions is like, how do you as a farmer or entrepreneur on the continent engage in a, in, a, in a better relationship with investors or how do you as an intermediary facilitate that? And I just would say that um, one of the things that we need to be looking at is alternative, um, um, alternative approaches towards return. And one of them is a shared benefits approach. And there are multiple um, um, creative finance approaches. People are using royalties and other ways of um, uh, gaining some value from their investment, but it's a fair value and a shared value over time. And um, if you look at um, creative finance around the transition out of industrial ag towards regenerative or organic in the in the U.S., that's what I've studied the most. Um, they're all using very different kinds of financial structures. They're not using this debt interest model. They're using equity. They're using long-term pools of capital. They're using evergreen capital. And um, they've actually managed to reduce the risk quite substantially and see return. And people are willing to take much lower return because they're contributing to something that's really um, creating a long-term sustainable um, solution. Um, so anyhow, I, I just, I, I think um, there's there's a lot of work to be done there. And I, and I um, would support Daniel in that we need to really shore up and strengthen civil society structures and local structures so that um, uh, uh, people can engage in um, stronger relationships and, and enter into investment relationships with their eyes wide open. Um, we do, it for just the point on foreign exchange risk that you brought up, Charlene, so there are local banks that are providing loans that are not in foreign capital, right? Um, I mean, one of the traps of receiving foreign capital um, that I've seen with many, um, you know, um, uh, uh, large uh, networks of cooperatives that are that are you know at the multi-million dollar stage and can accept outside capital is that they have to have an um, an export capital stream in order to service that um, foreign exchange rate issue. They have to have some exports, and so it really excludes those businesses that are primarily focused on local markets. And so that's one of the problems, as I would say, for foreign investors is don't make loans in foreign capital, make loans in local capital and, you know, take on that risk. Um, so there are some really interesting pro projects. There's one called Aceli um, that's trying to support local banks to make loans. One of the problems is local bank loan rates are very expensive. Um, they're almost prohibitive for farmers. And so that's something that we've got to work on is Aceli is trying to actually reduce um, the interest rate that farmers are charged. Um, and then, um, yeah, I think, I think, you know, the question about regenerative ag versus agroecology and purism. I mean, I think um, people are experimenting and trying to figure out how to make it work. And I'm not, um, I, I don't believe things need to be perfect. I think um, we need to look at the intentionality of the farmers and the networks. And if, are they moving in this direction? Is, are there fundamentally agroecological values within their business model? And I think that's something that needs to be evaluated and be part of the business model itself. Um, and yet it's gotta, it's gotta have a profit. And you know, no farmer wants to be involved in something where they're not making a profit at the end of the day. Um, so I'll, I'll just stop there. Uh, Gertrude, um, please feel free to, to chime in. Um, well, Gertrude, feel free to interrupt me, <laughs> but I'll jump in, <laughs> but I'll just give it another second. I know she's having some difficulty with her connection. Okay, jump in, but uh, but uh, please do feel free to interrupt me. Just a couple of quick comments, if I may, on the uh, uh, on the regenerative agriculture question. Um, I don't know if folks saw there was a really interesting uh, article that came out last week. I think it was called "Does Regenerative Agriculture Have a Race Problem?" It appeared in Civil Eats, um, 
And it was, uh, it was in response to a recent film that some of the audience may have seen called Kiss the Ground, I believe the name of it was, um, which featured largely US-based regenerative agriculture and largely white farmers. Um, and I thought it was, um, so, I mean, on the one hand, you know, there's this film that's come out, it's been very well received. It's been apparently, you know, very awakening for a lot of farmers and seeing a lot of the possibilities of Regen Ag. So that's fabulous, sort of gets them started on a on a pathway that, you know, we've all been talking about this, this long transition. And the other hand, you know, it was kind of fraught with, you know, maybe the film itself, but maybe some characteristics of the regenerative agriculture movement writ large um, in terms of some of the more political and, and, and racial equity dimensions. So, um, you know, I, I think that the, the, this kind of debate that, that was provoked by the film and, you know, the, the, the good and the bad, um, is really positive. I mean, that's what we're, we're, we're all learning, we're all moving. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think that there has been some, I, I think the agroecology movement has really, uh, has challenged in a lot of ways the regenerative agriculture movement to kind of begin to move towards those more equity dimensions. Um, and I think that that's, you know, that's some of the, it, it, what the, the question suggested in there was, um, the, the 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 person that posed the question I think is is whether to move things towards agroecology, which is by nature more inclusive in that sense. Absolutely, um, but I think that there's this there's this really important dialogue happening between these kind of you know whether it's fortunate or unfortunate you know each sort of movement has its or each uh, approach has its constituency and the important things as we move together towards these um, equity and ecological principles. So I think that's really good. I think one of the thing I just mentioned is that. Um, I was on a session last week with somebody from IFAD, the International Fund for Agricultural Development, the, the UN affiliated agency. And they're in the process of, um, uh, they, they just completed a stock taking, what they called a stock taking exercise, where they looked at their portfolio of, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of investments in agricultural development. And we're, we're, we're trying to kind of you know, the, the same way that Jen had had discussed, we're trying to kind of uh, identify categorizing accord, according to what level of um, transition the investment was uh, encouraging. And so that they found a very small percentage that was, you know, kind of transformational in that sense. But I think that the, the exercise of looking inside, doing this kind of evaluation, seeing, you know, whether all oh, we're just focusing on, you know, in, uh, substitution of inputs or really we're fo focusing on something much more transformational, it begs, it begs reflection, which of course is really important. And it also begs accountability because they actually published this study. So it's available to people and it's available to the farmer organizations, the governments they support, governments that are also involved in uh, the UN FAO system where there's been a lot of push towards a, a really kind of broad sense of agroecology through this. You know, there's been a big debate within the Committee on Food Security, a very important movement towards agroecology. So, I mean, I think that these things are all kind of steps in the right direction. Um, and, you know, the, but, but it's important that we do that kind of evaluation and we hold one another to account. So I'm going to pose one quick last question, um, and then we can wrap up because we're near the, the hour. Um, so this question is from someone who's a permaculture and regenerative land, land designer in the UK, and he's, he or she says, um, or she, I have an investable project proposal worked out, but what is the best way to engage with the capital investors to bring the project to fruition? Um, she makes the point that agroecology is being attacked by U.S.'s Kip Tom and others in the U.N. Committee on the World Food Security, as well as by Big, Cor Big Corporate Ag, which makes sense, um, which sees agroecology as a threat to its model and profits. How do we defend agroecology and build support for this approach? It is an activism in there, I think. There's a question about connecting to the investors. And then the second piece is ensuring that this movement continues to grow and, and building support for it with the recognition that those who are in the international landscape may not always be supportive. And I think you've spoken to some of it, but if you want to just do a final addressing. Yeah, I, I don't know if Gertrude has something to add there. Um, I know she said she's available for Zoom afterwards and her connection might be better. So maybe we could spend a few minutes afterwards really hearing from her then. Um, the only thing I would say is that it's really important 
um, that those on the capital seeking side are very clear on um, their time horizon, um, their return profile and what they really need and are able to say no um, as, as well as say yes. And I think, you know, finding the right investors and partners is, is very critical. And um, in many cases, you know, I've worked with many um, investees who are looking for investments. Um, oftentimes they're actually not really interested in investment capital. They really need grant capital or um, some kind of bilateral, they need more runway um, to prove out their model and they're really not ready for investment. And that's, um, I, I just have found a lot are not ready, or I'm not, um, can't assess their readiness for outside capital and it can actually um, be very, a very negative experience. Um, so um, yeah, th th it's a more complicated discussion or, but but that's that's one of the things that I've seen. Any final comments? No, I mean I think I think that this issue um, about incubation. I would say, um, please go ahead. No, it's it's okay. I'll quickly make a comment because I think my network keeps breaking. Um, it's on um, the advocacy around ag agroecology. Yes, it's for me, I think, because this is a, a system that threatens the, the current system which is in place. Um, there is need to, to do it in a way that, that convinces you to say what you're doing is for life like you are doing things in support of the regeneration of our life support system. And that change in attitude also helps you to continue to do the work, uh, which is to resist the dominant system and to also contribute to connecting with other movements to allow you to raise a much bigger voice to challenge the dominant system because if we continue to listen to the dominant narrative, then we are definitely um, putting life on planet Earth at risk. And we'll continue to experience the crisis that we are in, the climate crisis, the political crisis, the food crisis that we are in. And I think it's a responsibility for each person to, to do their part in promoting um activities or farming systems that are in support of life or that are in harmony with mother earth i think that's a great way to close daniel looks like you have one more burning thing that you wanted to say yeah, yeah. Well, just just that there's um you know I, I think we're all aware of kind of the ecosystem of service providers that are you know are, are seeking in some way or another to provide the kind of uh in investment capital and, and support and financing and i think the important thing is also to listen to them and to encourage them so to get together the the root capitals the one acres the various incubators some of which are you know from based in the U.S. or Europe, some of which are based in in this case in the African continent. But I mean, what what are, what are the obstacles that they're facing in really digging deep into the kinds of hopefully you know that would answer this woman's question about her her business and the many other millions of entrepreneurs that are seeking investment. So I think that we can we can encourage we can learn from them about the obstacles. We can encourage them and we can support them as they really develop a network um, in combination with you know public uh, service providers that can allow them to you know, get the, the financing that is needed to the kinds of Mother Earth uh, uh, honoring initiatives that uh, enterprises that Gertrude just mentioned. Wonderful. Well, we are officially out of time. I want to thank um, all three of my speakers um, today, uh, Daniel, Jen, and Gertrude for this excellent conversation. Um, I certainly found it very enriching and I hope our participants did as well. And thank you to the conference organizers for um, making the session happen. So thank you, everyone, and have a great day.